Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this briefing at the Jerusalem Press Club. I'm Talia Dekel Fleissig, CEO. On Saturday night, six months and a week exactly since the beginning of the Iron Swords War, the Islamic Republic of Iran launched a highly publicized coordinated attack of strike drones, ballistic missiles, and cruise missiles towards Israel. Joining us today is Navy Commander Retired Dr. Eyal Pinko, Senior Research Fellow at the Begin Sadat Center of Strategic Studies and a researcher and lecturer on intelligence, cyber, national security, and maritime security. Uh, just before we begin, I'd like to show you a short clip from JPC uh, from a JPC briefing in the first days of the war. Still, the IDF and the internal security services and the police forces are looking for more than 300, probably more than 300 commando operatives from Iran and Hamas that are inside the Israeli territory. More than 300. I want you. To, I want to emphasize, this is not a Hamas operation. This is Iranian operations. We see and we heard videos of commando operatives that are inside Israel speaking in Farsi. Okay, so first of all, Dr. Pingo, thank you for joining us. Uh, how, how do you feel about your assessment half a year down the line? Yeah, first I see myself over there uh, exhausted after many, many days without sleep. And uh, uh, I think uh, from the beginning, it was uh, pretty clear that uh, Iranian, uh, every, everything is uh, was directed and built uh, by Iranian uh, Quds Force and the uh, Revolution Guard. Uh, and we see that more and more. We see that from uh, the Yemen side uh, with the Houthis attack. We see that from the attacks coming from Iraq, from the uh, militias over there. And we see that, of course, from Hamas and Hezbollah. So uh, we see now the whole picture uh, popped up and uh, everything is, uh, I think, pretty obvious. All right. Well, you've been monitoring Iran, of course, its policy in the region since long before October 7th. Uh, but could you maybe elaborate on what was different about Saturday night's attack in terms of everything that you that you knew about uh, the regime up until now? Yeah, I must I must say, uh, as you said, I, um, I, uh, I, I know Iran for many years as an intelligence officer in various organizations and uh, as well as uh, I did my PhD also on Iran, another perspective. And I, I must say that uh, uh, this is totally abnormal behavior of Iran because the Iranian doctrine, the Iranian philosophy is uh, what, we, what we call a non-contact warfare or uh, indirect warfare. Uh, and it means that Iran is not fighting directly with its enemies. Iran sending someone else to die, to sacrifice himself uh, as Hamas, as Hezbollah, as, as I said, the Yemen Houthis, and the, the way that Iran was directly firing missiles and drones towards Israel, this is totally abnormal behavior of Iran uh, in this manner. All right, so turning over to the Israeli side, um, how do you think Israel views this situation strategically? Of course, uh, Israel was able to, uh, to, to intercept uh, most of the projectiles, as well as the, uh, the the allies that participated in the efforts, as well. Um, what do you think uh, is going on right now in Jerusalem in terms of, you know, the next steps ahead and what uh, what strategy it should be taking? Yeah, there are, there are many assessments of what is uh, going to happen. There are many voices inside the Israeli government uh, saying that Israel should react against the uh, the Iranian attack. Uh, if if we need to uh, maybe to adjust or remember two weeks ago, uh, an Iranian highly ranked uh, general was uh, killed in a building near the embassy. I spoke yesterday with many people from uh, foreign media. They asking, they told me yes, but uh, Israel hit an embassy. So the answer is no. Uh, first, Israel didn't take any responsibility for uh, the uh, the assassination of this uh, general, and it was not. He was not stayed in the in any kind of embassy. He was near the embassy, uh, so uh, the uh, the reaction from Iran uh, came as uh, as a retaliation for uh, this uh, 
uh, this uh, killing of the general. And, and as I said, in Jerusalem, there are many voices calling uh, to, to react because if we understand the, uh, the cultural point of view of Iran, um, Iran understand that after this kind of attack, even though 99% of the uh, projectiles and um, uh, were destructed, uh, even though uh, Iran see this kind of operation as a huge success. It doesn't matter because let's say that 50 or 60 percent were um, intercepted in Iraq and in Syria. They are they were intercepted in the Israeli borders. Uh, there was one projectile that uh, fell in uh, in Air Force Base, causing not almost uh, no damages. But from the Iranian perspective, this is a victory. Uh, this is not something which is a, a failure. And then now, uh, you know, uh, people want to escalate the situation uh, in order to show Iran that they cannot do whatever they want. Um, I do believe that uh, because of the uh, U.S. aid and the British as well, the the pressure on Israel will be will be such as not to not to not to react at all. Uh, uh, Israel is ready to react, but I think nothing will happen. This is my own belief. Even though I'm always saying that in the Middle East, you can always forecast the past. You cannot forecast the future. Uh, so uh, I think that the next day or two, everyone here is very under huge tension. I do believe there is no, if there will be something, it would be in a very soft way, something like a cyber attack or something like that. There will be no, from my assessment for now, and no, no um, uh, some kind of uh, kinetic uh, reaction. So, so your your field is less on Israeli society itself. So we, we're not going to open up the discussion of of whether you know politically uh, the Netanyahu government needs to react in order to appease its its uh, constituents. But if you're looking at it from an Iranian point of view, from the point of view uh, of the Islamic Republic, can Israel afford not to react in a way that will deter them? Israel lost quite a bit of deterrence on the seventh of October. Is this not one of the uh, one of the considerations that should be taken when uh, the country was under direct attack from Iran for the very first time? Yeah, I, uh, you know, there is always like we drive on the road and we say it's better to be uh, smart than to be right. Uh, I think I think the right way, the, the, the right uh, way to go ahead is to attack Iran, to show uh, to show uh, the deterrence, to, to bring back the deterrence as we're doing uh, with Hezbollah. Hezbollah is attacking, we are attacking back and all. I think this in this situation now it will not be the right way to go. I think it's not it's not good to do that. Um, it, it's it's not smart way to do to do the things uh, because first we need to uh, remember that uh, the IDF is still in the Gaza Strip. There are uh, plans to go into the into Rafah to uh, eliminate Hamas military capabilities, which I think it's much more important for the Israeli security, the tactical and strategical uh, point of view. So now to go uh, to escalate it and to go back to Iran because it, I don't think it will be smart <clears throat> uh, because Iran will uh, react again and it will be become like an avalanche. Uh, I think we don't need it now uh, in, in the Israeli situation. We understand if if it will go there, Hezbollah will join much much uh, harder into this uh, game, and uh, I think it will it will open a global uh, campaign. Because uh, U.S. and the U.K. will not stand aside, French, France as well, and this, this uh, from the other side, Russia and China, and it will it become a situation that uh, I think the world cannot afford itself uh, now. And in this manner, I think that sh we should be smart and not right. So, I mean, you've already you've already touched on the issue of, uh, of Gaza and Rafah. Do you think that um, the show of support that the international community gave uh, in the attacks on Saturday night, especially considering the, di the direct involvement of some of them, uh, indicate any uh, any change in the support that Israel might have mm -hmm. in an extensive uh, operation in Gaza, specifically in Rafah, or are we where we were a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> the main, mainly the Israeli uh, Israeli American uh, relationships are something like a sinus wave. And it reminds me like a, a case of a, of a man and a, and a wife and a husband. Uh, you, you cannot with and you cannot without. Uh, I think that the Israeli-American relationships are solid uh, through the years and didn't change. And it has some kind of fluctu fluctuation. 
Um, you know, uh, by Biden administration at the beginning of, of the war, the help that we got from them was amazing. Uh, with uh, supporting the UN, uh, which is totally uh, against Israel by its decisions, with support with ammunition and and many other things. Even even in the, the beginning of the war, if you remember, uh, the U.S. Navy, the Sixth Navy, was in front of the uh, uh, Lebanese uh, shores in order to show the flag, showing saying we are here, don't attack Israel. So I think the support from the Biden administration is amazing and solid. You, you know, during the the last few months, uh, mainly because of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, pressure from the inside of the U.S., we see that uh, there are some kind of uh, vows dancing with uh, with uh, Biden. Uh, he needs to satisfy his voters, and he is looking uh, to, uh, towards November to the election. And from the other end, uh, he uh, he supports Israel. So this is some kind of, uh, of a dance to to show uh, empathy to the brother Muslim, uh, Muslim Brotherhood and, and at the same time to Israel, which is totally contradictive. Uh, even even the, the initiation of the floating uh, port, which I believe it will not go anywhere, but another uh, showing off that the Biden is doing a thing. So, but at the end, in the average, I think that the Biden administration helped a lot Israel showing uh, the, the U.S. support and basically or mainly showing the unity and uh, between Israel and the U.S., which is solid uh, during the years. Do you think that these developments are going to impact uh, the international community's um, policy surrounding Iran's nuclear, uh, nuclear plans? Do you think the events of Saturday night will have any impact on, uh, on you know, on plans for sanctions, on... Will, will will players think twice before re-entering a nuclear agreement? Do you think that there's a connection between the issues? At first, I think uh, maybe um, to emphasize, uh, Israel uh, intercepted uh, more than 350 uh, different type of missiles and drones, including ballistic missiles and crews and etc. As you said, if one of them, or for example, the ballistic missiles were equipped with nuclear uh, a warhead, we, we had to deal with a totally different story. So the fact it was not just, just a, a, a simple conventional uh, warhead, it, uh, may, it put us in a very it, more convenient place. It's not nice, but it's more convenient. Uh, but uh, with a nuclear uh, uh, warhead, we will be in a different, totally different story. Um, I. From from some reason, I, I believe that it will not change the uh, the EU or the, the world opinion uh, towards the Iranian and nuclear uh, facilities and nuclear uh, military program. I do believe that uh, soon we'll go back on track and it will be forgotten. And uh, we need to remember that uh, uh, according to the UN um, estimation two years ago, May 2022, Iran already have the uh, nuclear, uh, the military nuclear capabilities. So I think it's already there. It's a matter of uh, using it. And uh, the issue now is to uh, to try to counter as much as we can uh, those capabilities. I think that the world will go uh, to its own business uh, and it will be forgotten very fast. Uh, what one reporter is asking again on the issue of deterrence. Um, if you can, if you can talk a little bit about the fact that Iran is very vocal and uh, and uh, you know public about its intentions and about its specific uh, ac actions, whereas Israel uh, very rarely takes responsibility for for its uh, alleged strikes that are always reported by foreign sources, uh, specifically that we've seen, of course, in Syria over the last few years and and other uh, and other areas. Um, do you think that this is a policy that Israel should continue to? to adopt um, in, in, in the wake of such a verbal and public uh, confrontation? Yeah, Israel uh, took a decision in 20, uh, 2002, uh, 22 years ago, uh, while uh, min, uh, Prime Minister uh, Ariel Sharon was there with uh, Dagan, the former uh, head of the Mossad, uh, to go to a shadow war, which means to fight the uh, Iranian uh, nuclear uh, cap military capabilities which including also the, um, um, the cruise missiles and ballistic missiles program below the shadow to do things uh, without declar declaration. 
And I think this, those efforts will continue. And for Israel, it's better not to go to the public and uh, speak about uh, bragging what uh, Israel can do and cannot do. I think uh, playing the game below the shadows bring more deterrence. And uh, even though you're not going to the public and it affect less the public opinion, it's better to do this way. Uh, for sure, Israel uh, doesn't do a good job when we go to the public opinion and uh, the influence of showing what, what un under which type of life we have with the rockets and the... Uh, and uh, attacks that are constantly since we left the Gaza Strip. Uh, so uh, it's better to do that and uh, not to not to go public. This is my opinion. All right, and uh, just a few more questions as we wrap up. One reporter is asking about the participation of other uh, other other states, including Jordan itself. Uh, and uh, you know, we saw those pictures of uh, of Jor Jordanian pilots even uh, taking part. Um, do you think? This is something that will impact uh, Iran's ability to, you know, with, um, be 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 the large player in the area that it intends to be within the Muslim world. What should we be making out of this participation of moderate Sunni states or otherwise? Yes. Uh, first, I, I would I would like to say that I was totally surprised from the Jordanian act, uh, and uh, I think that it comes from uh, two uh, two sides. The first one, uh, uh, you know, Jordan is uh, pretty much depends on the U.S. And uh, most of the Jordanian military uh, equipment and platforms are uh, American platforms. And this is something that I believe that the U.S. Uh, uh, came and uh, told the, the Jordanian king to, to move forward with that to help Israel. Uh, secondly, uh, if you see what is happening in uh, Jordan, Iran, in the last uh, few years, especially in the last year, is trying to involve in what is happening in Jordan. Iran is trying to mess up with social media, with the Palestinian uh, uh, over there in Jordan, and trying to shuffle the, the cards inside Jordan. The king understand it well. So even though the king is on, on the media, is uh, uh, speaking about the, uh, the, uh, the East Jerusalem and Gaza Strip and all, he is afraid of what is happening inside his country. But you see that um, uh, below the shadows, once again, we go there, that below the shadows, the cooperation between Israel and Jordan is a very good cooperation in the economical world, in the military intelligence. So the connections, the ties are very strong. And also, uh, Jordan is also worried about uh, the Iranian involvement as a Sunni country against the, the Shia. And uh, we, we also, we, if we look on a broader aspect of what is happening within Hamas and Israel, we are only players on the chessboard. And the chessboard between, uh, I will say two dimensions. One is the dimension of the war between the West and East, the bloc, the Russian, Chinese, Iranian, North Korea, and Pakistan in the bloc, with the other bloc, which is European and NATO. This is one dimension. And the second dimension is the war be in between the Islam, which is between the, uh, the Shia countries led by uh, Iran and the uh, Sunnah countries as uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, UAE, Jordan, and Morocco. And you see the Abraham Accords, which brought prosperity into uh, the region and peace to the region until uh, the murderous uh, Hamas attack on October 7. So I think this is also part of uh, this uh, multi-dimensional world war between uh, the, the East and West and uh, the Islam. Uh, you're also a naval expert. And of course, we saw a couple of days ago, the uh, the uh, before the Saturday strike, uh, we saw the uh, attack, the trying to take over the ship um, in the in the uh, waters. And of course, we had mm -hmm. uh, between 2019, I think it was in 2021, a kind of standoff between the US and Iran uh, in, in the Gulf. Um, do you see this repeating itself anytime soon because of the, the developments happening now in the region, or are we far away from that? Uh, I will say that uh, since the 80s and since the, and since the iran iraq war, Iraq Iran understands that uh, blocking the Straits of Hormuz, this is something like uh, a very strategic point of uh, view. And uh, what we call it, we call it a choke point. 30% uh, of world oil goes 
uh, from this uh, choke point, from the Hormuz Strait. And Iran, whenever there is some kind of, uh, of tension, for many, many years, Iran just uh, saying, I will block the Hormuz Strait. And they did in the last uh, few years a little bit more aggressive moves as attacking ships in the in even in the Oman uh, Gulf and things like that. So this is a this is a be Iranian behavior. And every time there is some kind of tension, Iran does it to show the flag, as we say in the navy, showing the flag and saying that uh, uh, be aware we we can block this area. And you know once again uh, the Sunni countries against Iran over there. And uh, it's uh, something that we will, we will see keep on repeating, taking off uh, ships out of their course, uh, blocking the, the Ormos Strait, attacking ships in Oman, uh, Gulf. Uh, so uh, it, it's, a, it's a regular uh, thing over there. Okay, uh, one journalist is saying that while, while you, he knows that you oppose uh, a response to Iran, uh, if not oppose the response to Iran, we, you know, the, a, a, a large, larger one and you're more for a mild one. Uh, what is your prediction that the current government will actually do uh, given its uh, given its current makeup and uh, own uh, considerations? Yeah. As as for now, uh, as I said, uh, the, the dynamics in the Middle East is so uh, high that um, I, I, I don't want to forecast for the long period of time. But as for now, now and with the Biden administration uh, pressure, I believe that uh, in, it will be very not likely that Israel will make some kind of uh, aggressive uh, retaliation against the Iranian uh, attack. It can be some kind of as a soft uh, or from zero or from nothing goes to some kind of uh, soft reaction, some kind of uh, cyber attack or attacking any kind of Iranian uh, infrastructure in Lebanon or in Syria, I don't think it will go more than that. This, the, I think this will be the maximum uh, action that will come from the Israeli side. Okay, and just one last question that has come in. Do you think there is a chance of uh, MEAD, the Middle Eastern Aerial Defense, being upgraded to full-scale defense alliance like NATO, uh, or alternatively could come in, this, in, in the format of a clause in the Abraham Accords? updated version? Is that something that you think is potentially possible? Uh, yeah, see, uh, first, um, there is a treaty between the US and, uh, and in Israel for uh, aerial defense. And uh, you see that immediately uh, the fifth and the sixth uh, navies uh, came to the region uh, in the Middle East and the Red Sea uh, to enforce the, uh, uh, the aerial defense. So it, it goes many, many years uh, back, in my, some, I believe something like 30 years back, so this is a stable and it, it, we, we saw it that it's happening in real time uh, last uh, Saturday. Uh, uh, Israel is, uh, uh, is participating in some of NATO's activity and Israel, is, Israel uh, wills to help any uh, NATO country. You saw even the Germany bought uh, um, the aerial defense systems from Israel and Israel is from with NATO is willing to, uh, to participate and take part in technologies, in know-how, in other uh, areas as well. So I do believe uh, this uh, event with the understanding that the Iranian ammunition and weapons will appear in Russia, as we saw it in Ukraine, I think that this will also enforce the cooperation between Israel and NATO forces. Okay, I promised that there was the last question, but one more has gone in. Uh, mm -hmm. Just in terms of whether you think that this uh, development over the last few days is a game changer, or we're really just uh, every everyone flex their muscles and we can we can all go back to where we were before. As as for now, I will I would have guessed that it's a good time to go to a spa to relax and to have some uh, some time to uh, relax the mind because I do believe that with all the uh, things that are going on, Israel will not uh, retaliate and uh, and things will continue. Uh, I think the next uh, phase is to uh, go inside Rafah. I think it's uh, this will be the next Israeli move and to put aside this uh, event. Uh, we, you know, it's, we, we, uh, we spoke about it's a five or 350 rockets uh, from Iran, but on on a normal daily basis, we are facing almost two hundred rockets from and missiles from Hezbollah. So uh, we, for for us, this is the reality since the uh, since Israel left the Gaza Strip. 
So uh, I think this is a small hit in the wing, as we as we love to say, and uh, we I think it will be kept aside. Dealing now with uh, Rafah, dealing uh, try to understand what will be the next move with Hezbollah. I think this is much more important than dealing with uh, this uh, Iranian event. I think that this is what eventually will, will happen. So if, if we already have you on the line for another minute or so, maybe you can give your analysis of what you think will happen on our northern border, considering the fact that we still have tens of thousands of Israelis displaced uh, and we're dealing with a direct Iranian proxy on that border too. Yes, uh, so regarding Hezbollah, I, I think I do believe that Hezbollah and Israel don't want to go to this war. Hezbollah is paying some uh, fees to his uh, master, to the Iranian uh, regime. And, uh, you know, he's trying to annoy us. Uh, if, if you can call uh, 100 to 200 rockets per day uh, some kind of inconvenience. And you see that all the reactions are, are small ones, hitting here, hitting there, and uh, we are continuing with our lives. Um, at, at this stage, while the IDF is in Gaza and Hamas was not finished yet, Israel will not go to a war with Hezbollah. This is my assessment. For Israel, it's not the best. Uh, it, Israel can, but it's not the best solution to go into a, another front uh, for this moment, especially when the holidays are coming. Uh, I don't believe it will be uh, in, with these uh, two fronts. Uh, as I said, the, the capabilities are there, but the will is not. Uh, so I think this is the main issue. We also, we need to, uh, to remember that Hezbollah is in a very bad situation in Lebanon. The economy is very bad over there. It's under pressure. Even uh, in the last few weeks, uh, Hezbollah forces were under attack from Christian population in Lebanon. Um, and, you know, um, uh, he, he doesn't, he, he lost his political power as well in the last elections. Uh, so Hezbollah doesn't feel well over there. He needs to pay his master the fees and attacking Israel, I, I mean, Iran. And for the other end, he's not feeling well there. So uh, he's dancing, a uh, small dancers. Uh, he, he his, from, from the Hezbollah perspective, it's better that Israel will start a war. In this way, you can say, this is not me, Israel starts. And as I said, the Israel, the Israel will is to finish uh, Hamas and go to uh, peace uh, and normalization and not, not uh, go to a war with Lebanon. And while we are there, I, I think it will not go to uh, escalation in Lebanon as well. Okay, Dr. Eyal Pinko, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very we'll, much. We'll do this call in another six months to see how you're feeling about what you said today. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to bye everyone bye. who joined on the line and uh, to my colleagues, Jonathan Beck and Ali Noor for facilitating this, uh, this briefing. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.